Hello, 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 welcome. Hope your march has been good. It is time for Avos of Harvo 3. Wow, I can't believe this is still going. What am I doing? Anyways, let's quickly get into the books. This is going to be a effective cut. Yeah. Okay, wow. I am so close to dropping the wine. I think that was a good idea. Okay, so I read this many this month. Everything's upside down, or not. It's fine. We'll work through it. Uh, I got through everything, which was exciting. I got one of every category. It is, would I say it's less ambitious than last month? Maybe. But I did get some really interesting things. So glad to go through this. Hopefully I will talk about some books that haven't been talked about for a while. That's maybe the theme of this month is books that are old and haven't been talked about for a while. Okay, so first one I read this month was going to be the big book, The Sea, The Sea by Iris Murdoch. Now, I actually knew nothing about this book going in. The reason why I picked this up was I wanted something that was aesthetic to read on the train that didn't look weird. I had a lot of books in my collection that just would look weird to read on the train. I, I, I can't quite explain it, but I wanted a book with, a, with an aesthetic cover. And The Sea of the Sea has some really, really incredible editions that look just amazing. And I knew the title of the book just because of those editions. And I saw this book in a used bookstore. I decided to get it. It's not the most aesthetic, but it's it's fine. You know, it's fine. I like the title. I knew nothing about it. I expected some kind of beautiful, poetic book about the ocean. And what I got was not that, but it's interesting. So the premise is that this book is a diary from a man named Charles Araby. He is a successful theater director who is now old and he's decided to retire and live in this villa that's a little bit haunted on the edge of this big cliff next to the ocean. And so he arrives at this town and has trouble forming close relationships with everyone around there. But also he starts to talk about his own life and the kinds of experiences that he had. His family members and how close or distant he were to them and a few ex-partners and what, what effect they had on his life. And then weirdly enough, just about all these ex-partners turn up in some way, shape or form at his house. And so it's really a book about him going back through the retrospect of his life and stating his beliefs on what he wants love to be. That being said, Charles Araby is a terrible, terrible person. And I'm sure the novel's intent is for this to be the case. The first 100 pages are a section called prehistory. And it is just him narrating his life. It's narrating what his childhood was, what his childhood was like, what his family was like, how he grew up, and how he ended up getting into theater and getting to this house. That's a fifth of the book. That's twenty percent of the book is just him recounting life facts in an incredibly uninteresting way. And I think the general advice for people who want to write a novel is that. You should keep the prologue as short as you possibly can, right? You should start the action, you should start when something happens. And this book does the logical opposite of that. This book front ends all of the familial details to the point where when I got to page 100 something, if you would ask me what the plot of this book was going to be, if you ask me what really happens in this, I'd have no clue. I would not be able to tell you. There are a few vague hints the house is in is haunted, there's also this weird sea monster that it gets described that he watches. The waves are really treacherous, the landscape is really beautiful, but none of these things are really at the forefront in the first fifth of the book. At the forefront is really just who this person is, what his childhood was like, why is he so weird, and trying to impress the reader with a very specific way of looking at life. It was not very interesting. Then what happens is, and mild spoiler warning on the screen if anyone is worried about this 50 year old book is that he meets someone who he was deeply in love with as a young child. So before all of this whole theater stuff, he was deeply in love with this woman named Hartley and he decides that he is going to rescue her from what he views as a really unfulfilling life. And unfortunately, he is extremely misguided. He does not seem to be able to see the world from her perspective Instead, he invents this complex narrative in his head about how her life is so dissatisfying and how after he's retired, the only 
noble thing he has left to do in his life is to go rescue this woman and he ends up causing a lot of people a lot of pain in the process and it's just so frustrating to read because he is just such a weird deluded strange person and he can't take no for an answer and it's pretty clear that the book wants you to at least have a conflicted view of him like you would admire his determination and his really idealistic view towards love while you would at the same time criticize his just absolutely wild assumptions that he makes of the people around him it's it's a ride it's a ride but it's a ride that takes about a hundred plus pages to get to and at that point you realize that you're supposed to dislike this protagonist and dislike him the entire way. You want to just reach through the pages and just slap him and go, why are you like this? Why are you like this? Uh, if that sounds like a great time, then I would highly recommend The Sea to Sea. If you want to read a book about how beautiful the sea is, not, not this one. I give it a three out of five. Do I give it a three out of five? It's a very skillful book, but it is very long. And it breaks a lot of rules about what good fiction should be because the narrator doesn't care about those rules. The narrator is going to tell the story on his own terms and the author is very clear about this. So it's, I would say, an incredibly divisive book. It does make some interesting observations about relationships, about the way that we see others. It does make you work for the narrative and you do need to have faith in the author that this is going to go somewhere because otherwise just the opening of the book is just pain, right? Do do I recommend it? Yeah, I'd read it again. It's all right. All right, book two was The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Another Stories by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This was an interesting one because I knew of F. Scott Fitzgerald's short stories. He is known mostly for The Great Gatsby and a few other novels set in the 1920s, but he does have some well-known stories, especially this title one because of the David Fincher film, and I didn't really know what to expect. It's mi it's a mixed bag. There are some good stories in here, there are some bad stories in here. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button is a very bad story. It is a, if I was judging the story just by itself, it is a f 2 out of 5, maybe even a 1 out of 5. It's just so lackluster, so unambitious, and so frustrating that it dodges all the possible interesting things it could have done. It's a story about a man who ages backwards. So he's born in the hospital as an old man. No one really knows how this is the case or why this is the case, but he's taken home. His parents treat, or his father, his mother is implied to have died in childbirth. You don't think about the logistics of that. His father starts to treat him as if he was a toddler, despite the fact that he's very clearly a 70 year old man. And then he just ages backwards and goes through all these stages of life in this really strange way. So he goes to high school despite the fact that he's a, a clearly senile person. He eventually gets to the age that he's supposed to be, he gets into a relationship, and then he passes that point. So he ends up getting young while his partner gets old, and he's not very sympathetic about that. He is driven by the desires, the really stereotypical desires, of a person at his age would be. So this brings him into a lot of conflict. However, that conflict isn't thematic in any way. There's not really any point that's being made other than, wow, look, it's really weird that this person ages backwards. And maybe if you search for it, there's the point that society forces people to act in a certain way because of the way they look or the age that they are. The only problem is that it's not very clear about this theme. And if you really wanted to write a story about, or read a story about how society treats people based on the way that they look, you don't need the contrivance of a person who ages backwards. You've got lots of other different visual characteristics and prejudices in society to explore, right? So the, f the title story is just very, very weak to me. But there are some great stories in here. I really liked The Four Fists, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's about a guy who gets punched in the face four times. I just, I love the way they describe him. They say that, what is it? 
But it is certain that at various points in his life, hittable qualities were in his face as surely as kissable qualities have ever lurked in a girl's lips. Describing a person that just by their very demeanor wants you to punch them in the face. That's just incredibly funny. And it's about all the epiphanies that appear in his life because of these four punches. It's, just, it's such a goofy premise, but it's sold so well. Another one that I really like is called The Cut Glass Ball. It uses this really expensive centerpiece as a symbol for the really difficult life that a married woman has. And she she has this ball in her house, she has difficulty relating to her husband, and all of the issues manifest within this ball. I think what's really cool is this description very early on, where she gets married to her then husband, and someone who'd loved her before says, what did he say? He says, the night I told him I was going to marry Harold seven years ago in 92, he drew himself way up and said, Evelyn, I'm going to give you a present that's as hard as you are and as beautiful and as empty and as easy to see through. And it happens to be this giant glass ball and it becomes very representative of who she is and all the struggles in her relationship. There's just moments where symbols and metaphors work very well here. As I was reading, I realized that F. Scott Fitzgerald's writing style is a style that just doesn't really exist anymore. No one's writing like this because in the 50s and 60s, Hemingway and like the journalistic writing tradition made novels just so much briefer and short stories so much briefer that you don't have the space to just dwell in a nice symbol or metaphor for a really long time. And that's ultimately what this is, is that it's a lot of very clear crystallized moments that if it was to be published today, I think people would describe them as as overwritten or over-described. But they are interesting remnants of this era. I will note too that when Fitzgerald wrote a lot of these, he was very, very young. So most of these were published, I think, in the 1920s. Originally, let me see, 1922, 1920, one was 1932. He was very young. And that youth comes off very clearly in these stories. He's great at writing young men and kind of bad at writing everybody else. His women seem a bit one-dimensional. His old people seem very one-dimensional. They seem to just reflect on when they used to be young and have all those regrets. And But the, the 20s is when he really hits the stride. And that period of being young and reckless and impulsive and wanting everything in the world, but also not being able to reckon with how damaging your actions are, I think that's the best that Fitzgerald gets in Heath's short stories. I probably wouldn't recommend this, though. I think that you'd have to really like Fitzgerald as a writer and as a person to enjoy these stories. One of the big problems that I have with all of his work is that he seems very judgmental. He writes, even if he's using first person, he writes from the perspective of an observer character who kind of looks down on all the characters and judges their faults, reveals their shortcomings, and kind of assumes that the reader will share in that sense of judgment. And I don't view a lot of these characters in the same way. I don't have the same tragic attitude towards them. So I don't vibe with what these stories are trying to do very often. That being said, if you love his style, this is just more of his style. This collection has only seven stories. It has uh, Benjamin Button. It has Head and Shoulders, The Cut Glass Ball, Four Fists, May Day, Oh Russet Witch, and Crazy Sunday. Even between these seven stories, we're starting to get repetitive themes ideas that come up again and again, again and again. If you would prefer, I would suggest getting a larger collection of his stories, because I think the joy of reading Fitzgerald's short stories is that you get some that are good and some that are bad. There are some where he was really trying hard to say something, and you get some where even he himself admitted at the time he just wanted a paycheck, and having that contrast is very fun. Overall, though, this collection, I think it gets a 3 out of 5. It's okay. Below the sea of the sea, I would not recommend this. Maybe only the title story so people can see how bad it is. Alright, so next one for March. Shirley Jackson's We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Two little tiny orange books in a row. This one is a classic of horror fiction. Shirley Jackson is probably one of the best horror authors ever, I would say. She's incredible at writing in this genre. And her style is so distinct because she doesn't write shock horror or 
even really tense horror. She writes the kind of horror that makes you just doubt your perceptions of the world and get very confused about how you think about other human beings. Every now and then I would read a sentence in this book and I would turn around and go, wait, did they just, they, did they just say that? Is this really a human being doing these things? And that uncanny quality really seeps in under your skin as you read and you just get so uncomfortable and so disturbed. The premise is that there's this very old mansion that's two young women, uh, the narrator named Mary Cat or Mary Kate and her bigger sister named Constance live in and the backstory is that everybody else in this large extended family died from a poisoning incident and Constance was blamed for it but then she was acquitted. For some reason all of the townsfolk just absolutely hate this family. They they do not like them at all and they express their hate so clearly. So Constance is agoraphobic, she does not go outside and Maricat has to be everything for this family. Despite the fact that she's 18 years old and acts like she's 12, she goes out and buys all the groceries and does a lot of the cleaning and sets everything up and together Maricat and Constance live this just reclusive, strange life. They have an uncle named Julian who sits around the house and needs their support, but he's trying to write the story of the poisonings that happened earlier, and they have this really secluded existence. And then some stuff happens to upset the balance and things just start to go pear-shaped from there. It's a fascinating book. I think I enjoyed it even more having read The Afterword by Joyce Carol Oates, and I can really see Joyce Carol Oates taking a lot of inspiration from Shirley Jackson style, that kind of disturbing, darker look at ordinary life. Knowing Jackson's context and her own experiences with agoraphobia and also the experiences of xenophobia that she had in her, I think, New England locale, and just the way that people treated her as almost subhuman for, for being Jewish, that was really fascinating. And I think that manifests really clearly in this work. You feel that menace all the way through as you read. You start to understand what it's like to be irrationally hated by the whole of the town and to wonder whether your experience of the world is normal and everyone else is twisted and dark or whether there's something deep-seated that's wrong with you. That is really quite priceless. That feeling just lingers for so long. I gave the, I gave her other novel last year I read The Haunting Hill House. I gave that a 5 out of 5. I thought that was just incredible structurally from a character perspective. Just everything about it was just so marvellous and I still think about it all the time. Is The mechanics of that story were just, just incredible. And this one, I don't get that same sense of incredible twisted quality from it. I don't think this one will linger in my head quite as long as The Haunting of Hill House. And maybe it's because this one, mild spoilers, has less of that supernatural, whereas The Haunting of Hill House really does mess with the reader's head. And this one is a bit more psychological rather than supernatural. I think also, and I've read a lot about the criticism of this book, the positive criticism, is that it represents a more feminine experience compared to The Haunting of Hill House. The Haunting of Hill House had a really balanced cast of genders, and this one, is about two sisters and really pitting them against everybody else in the world. So there's a lot to be said about the feminine experience in this novel that I personally wouldn't be able to relate to. And I would certainly absolutely recommend this though. I think different people get different things out of her novels. Some people find them very hard and inaccessible and I can see that because you need to be willing. You need to be willing to step into the book and let yourself be disturbed and let yourself invest in these characters who then turn out to be strange or grotesque or unreliable. You need to have that vulnerability within yourself before you start reading because then that's when you experience the fullness of what these books have to offer. But I would absolutely stress giving it a try. This one gets a 4 out of 5 only because I want to preserve how much I love The Haunting of the Pass. Oh, I love The Haunting of the Pass so, so much. That's, um, yeah, so that would have been a 5 out of 5. This is a 4 out of 5. 
if the Haunting of Hill House didn't exist, maybe this would be a 5 out of 5. I don't know. These, these baitings don't make any sense. Okay, book four is Benevolence by Julie Jansen, published by Magabala Books. This is a historical fiction novel set in where I am. So I am currently recording on Daragland in the northwest of Sydney, and this novel is set in the 1800s around this area. So it was really, really fascinating to see suburbs like Parramatta and Blacktown and Windsor, places that I could drive to in about 15 minutes, to see the representations of this in history and then recognize the kind of difficult situations, I really should not underplay that, the kinds of massacres and genocide of the Aboriginal people that, that occurred on these lands is incredibly harrowing, but also just so important to know. There's so much history that honestly just wasn't taught to me in when I was in primary school and high school studying about Australian history. And I think it's because it's so uncomfortable that we live on land on which these things happened and we benefit from it because our stability, our houses, our structures, everything that we have here, it is the way it is because of just the sheer atrocities that the colonizing Europeans did to the Aboriginal population in the 1800s, which was not that long ago. This book was written using a lot of research from historical records. The author made an incredible website called History of Aboriginal Sydney, where she puts together all of the things that she found in her search. And she traces back her own lineage as well to people just like the ones in the story. She fictionalizes events that she discovered through conversations and through research and through archival work. And it's, it's just so, it's so much. It just becomes so overwhelming. I could really only read two or three chapters at, a, at once because you need to step back and reflect because it is so significant to the life that I guess I personally live today is to know things like this happened and were never really atoned for. It's, it's very painful. It makes you very vulnerable and reflective. I will say that I wish this novel was a lot longer because it traces the story of a single woman named Murugin or Mary James as the, the house that she goes to calls her. She is an Aboriginal Australian woman who is brought up in this house, or is English boarding house in order to teach her Western European values. And there's all of that assumption of Eurocentrism and how English is more civilized and all of that crap, right? But it creates this deep-seated trauma within her because she is disconnected from her family and from her uh, historical way of life and yet she is still never fully accepted into European society because of her skin color and her race. So she's in this strange middle ground where she relies on everybody for their goodwill but the goodwill that everybody gives her is tinged with some kind of ulterior motive. Like the Westerners will treat her nicely but they want her to be uh, subservient to the household and they will always treat her as lesser or they will treat her as someone who is meant to be pitied or they will treat her as someone who can help the western colonizers talk to the other aboriginal people for the purpose of destroying them and reducing any possible resistance they may have to european colonization that's the kind of kindness that she gets it's just so harrowing it's so it's so stressful to read this because there are historical figures who today a lot of Australia would still respect. There's statues devoted to them. There's historical records explaining the kinds of work they did into making Sydney and Australia the way that it is. But they are represented not just in the fiction of the novel, but also in its use of archival material from newspaper cuttings from the time they had some really painful values and they treated the Aboriginal people around them just so, so horribly. And it's a mix of ignorance and greed and selfishness and honestly just cruelty. And that's just hard to read. It's very, very hard to read. I am so thankful that this novel exists because I wish, I wish there was something like this for 
just about every region of Australia, everywhere that Aboriginal people used to be or remain surviving, all of these places, I want to see the stories of that. And this is one of the reasons why I want this year to be one that I focus more on reading Aboriginal literature, is because it reveals things that you historically would not have known, or it reveals things that you, you would never have assumed based on your lived experience in Australia. And it reveals that Australian history has tried, well, European white Australian history has tried very, very hard to cover up the atrocities that were committed by the colonizers and to suggest that the way that Australia became what it is today, that that entire process has been a good thing. And to resist that overwhelming narrative is something just incredible and incredibly valuable. I hate that I think in numbers because I have to give things scores. This one in my mind got a four out of five because it said so many incredible things to me, but it was also just so, so much in a very short amount of time. It spans about 30 years in about 300 pages. So really one year gets the detail of about 10 pages. Lots of things happen very, very fast. The, the protagonist will go to a place, live there for a couple pages, experience a good thing, experience a bad thing and move on. I know part of this is to illustrate the transience of her existence and just how unpredictable it is, but the emotional weight and impacts never really coalesces into one cohesive thing. I wish that it focused more on certain parts of her life and I hate to phrase it this way, but made clearer narrative arcs to illustrate the point. Because as I read it, in the way that it is, it's a bit like a historical document. It's a lot like a survival novel. It's a lot like a novel, I guess, traditionally, if you would think of canonical European survival novels as a person who gets stranded on a deserted island or something and they need to find out how to survive. They need to fight against nature and make small incremental successes and risk giant setbacks. This is a survival novel where instead of surviving nature, the protagonist is surviving her culture being colonized and so the steps forward and the steps back are finding some place to stay for a couple of weeks or finding someone to take care of you that isn't going to take advantage of you whereas the setbacks are enormous the setbacks are being uh, trialed or uh, being arrested or being blamed for crimes that you didn't commit or for the crimes of, or watching people that you love be lost and that's all of that is in this book. There's so much in this book. I wish there was more space given to it. I wish I could have spent more time with the narrator. But really, it's just... You're distant and you're watching something really, really hor horrible happen. And, yeah, it's, it's hard. Okay, book five of March. Gosh, it feels really weird to transition out of that. This is Water for Elephants. This is garbage. Well, it's fun. It's okay. It's not bad. It's entertaining. It's forget forgettable. So the premise of this is Great Depression's America. There are traveling circuses that go around the country on trains. The protagonist is a, a student studying veter veter veterinary studies. Sorry, it took me a while to say that. Animal doctor. Animal doctor. He's a vet. And he's almost at the end of his studies, except something tragic happens, he loses both his parents, and he's unable to continue his studies because they don't have the finances for it. He decides to jump on the train, that train happens to be the travelling circus, and he joins the travelling circus as a vet. That's just the entirety of the story. It's also a kind of love story, it's the kind of rescue a woman from an abusive relationship kind of love story, which is just incredibly tropey and honestly kind of damaging to real-world relationships. But it does feel good. Like, it's a great hero's journey kind of novel. It... The structure is odd. The structure is very, very odd. Because it starts at first with the climax of the novel. Just everything going pear-shaped. It's at the circus and the... Their version of an alarm, which is called the Disaster March. It's the orchestra playing a very specific song. Entirely, it's entirely chaos, right? All the animals have gone loose. Everything's a mess. And then it cuts into five decades into the future 
where the protagonist is an old man in a nursing home reminiscing about his time in the circus, and then it jumps back again to introduce us to the start of the story. So there's just this weird temporal thing going on. Every now and then we jump into the future and we talk, we read through the narrator's experiences as an old man trying to relive his glory days, and then we go back to his experience in the circus. It's okay. I did like the fact that the old person segments gave some breathing space because the circus segments themselves can often be just very hard to believe. It's whimsical and it's exaggerated and I feel like a lot of it comes from the subject material itself. I think that the American traveling circus is just so mythologized. Its use of stage antics and animals and performances and all of that, it's all larger than life. It's all illusion and smoke and mirrors and even the book itself explains this. There's this incredible whimsical quality to everything that happens in the past that it's nice to have the future moments as, as a kind of palate cleanser because it doesn't overwhelm the reader with any of that. I will say though that this book relies a lot on contrivances and if you're not really a person that can deal with that then you're just gonna be very disappointed. You get the the, the, the story starts this way. The protagonist just happens to lose his family on the very last moment of his veterinarian degree. He just happens to land on a train and he just happens to be in the carriage of a, a traveling circus and he just happens to meet the exact right people on this train to get him a job at the circus and he just happens, you see how it was going, right? It's just a lot of happenstance, a lot of coincidence and I think any book trying to sell realism would not rely so much on coincidence. But if you can stomach that, if you can handle it, then it's pretty fun. There's a lot of just really fun moments. There's lots of descriptions of performances, romance, conflicts, class conflict. Like there's this whole weird thing about performers and stagehands that there's this weird job discrimination going on. There's lots of very fun characters. It's fun. It's entertaining. I read this so fast. I read this, I think, over the course of two days. It's just so easy to get through. But ultimately, will I remember anything or will I think of it very highly? Not really. No. No. I gave it a 2 out of 5, but only because I'm kind of elitist. <laughs> and I wish it was a lot more and a lot better than this. But ultimately, I had fun with it. Yeah, that's how I describe it. Water for Elephants. Fun book. Doesn't mean anything. Okay, book 6. This is my world literature. It's a very small one, so it's kind of fall over probably. This is The Whale Rider by Witi Ihimera. It is a book about Maori culture in New Zealand, except it's it's very fascinating in the way that it frames it. It uses the creation myths and the, the local mythology and storytelling, but it's set in the modern day. And the premise is so interesting because it concerns the conflict between sticking with the beliefs in mythology and tradition and moving into more modern values. That's so fascinating to me to think about because I have that same experience myself as a Chinese person. There's a lot of Chinese culture and tradition that has no real scientific basis in anything, but it feels good to, to prolong those traditions and it may still be very meaningful to me in the end. And I think this book grapples with some of those ideas. So the premise is that there is a young girl named Kahu who is born into a really powerful family in the, what is it called? The, just a specific area of New Zealand, sorry. I don't have the names very memorized well. Uh, she's a daughter and then her mother passes away. Father passes away? Mother passes away. So unfortunately it means the lineage of that family doesn't have a male heir and traditionally the male heir is the one that carries on the ancestral role and becomes becomes connected to a spiritual figure in this belief system but because there is no male figure the grandfather has this personal sense of failing the grandfather is so motivated in prolonging this culture and teaching the young men how to grow up in Maori tradition and he's really quite heartbroken at the fact that Kahu is a girl who can't be the heir of this tradition and he has this personal failing there. 
it's really interesting because these characters are so human. They they do quite reprehensible things. They neglect each other. They fail to be the people that they should be to their family. But it is for a very understandable reason. And yet the family moments themselves are so vivid and so beautiful. I love just the simple moments of being with a family member, knowing exactly how they might react to a certain situation, knowing how they cook or how they walk around the house or just really small specific moments like that. It reminds me of just my own big family gatherings and meeting everybody and knowing how you're related to everybody and all of that history that builds together and grows when you've been in a place for a very long time. That's very beautiful to me. And it combines that with this fascinating magic realism style story of Maori legend and it all just comes together so nicely. It's very beautiful. There's a nice environmental message to it as well. It's surprising that it's often called a young adult novel because the themes in here are just very mature. It's really about being set in your traditions, growing old with one set of traditions and then being challenged by something which doesn't quite meet your expectations in exactly that way. It's interesting too because the narrator isn't Kahu, it isn't a young person or a child, it's someone in their 20s who's just kind of experiencing this from a distance. He can see the kinds of damage that the grandfather's values are causing, but he can also see the, the power from the younger generation. So it's just a really rich and complex and fascinating book. And I would recommend it to, to, to everybody, really. It does get a bit dark at times. I don't know if I would recommend it for, for children. But if you can understand these themes of, of culture and tradition and prolonging that and the struggles to do with prolonging that in our modern society, I think there's just so much to get at this. I, get, I would give it a 5 out of 5. I would recommend everybody read this. It's so short too. It's very easy to get through. I've heard some people commenting that there are some plot elements which don't fit in the grand scheme of the narrative and I would strongly disagree. I think that there's moments which seem arbitrary but they go towards making the characters feel more human. And I think ultimately that's what makes this so successful is that it is human and very uniquely flawed human characters grappling with these huge themes of tradition and ancestry and rituals and how they want to function within a way of living that is just so much bigger than they are. It's it's incredible. It's a masterpiece. I really, really like it. I will definitely come back to it again. Five out of five. All right, and last book of March. This is Michael Ondaatje's The English Patient. It won some awards. I have now forgotten. Oh, Booker Prize. Yeah, so it won the Booker Prize. It is a honestly kind of an inf infamous book that you study in high school. So. A bit of background is that this is the sequel to In the Skin of a Lion, which I have here, the same edition. I really like collections like this. Uh, in the Skin of a Lion is set in 1900 Canada, and it's about migrant workers building the dams and the bridges and the infrastructure of Canada. And this is a novel about World War II. So it follows some characters from the ending of In the Skin of a Lion, but this book is standalone. So you don't have to have read the other book to understand it. However, you do remember the significance of some of the characters. So I would recommend, if you're interested in it, then you can always go back and read the first one. It's It works. I think by itself, or as a series, it works really well. The premise is that there is this house in Tuscany where a, a burned man who fell from a burning plane is being nursed back to health by an, a young woman named Hana. And to this, a thief named Caravaggio who's connected to Hannah's backstory and a Sikh sapper whose job is to remove unexploded bombs ends up in this house as well. And so the four of them end up there together. They end up discovering about each other's past and what motivates them. And it's this very surreal, quiet space in the middle of what is otherwise an enormous and tragic war where these four human beings get together and start to reveal a little bit about themselves to each other. Each one has strong motivations, strong character development, but they test each other and they show what's so unique and critical about the way that each of them sees being human and living and having values and doing something with the time that we've been given in life. 
it, it sounds very philosophical. It, it is, kind of. I think the one thing that I learned about this book is that Michael and Nancho has this very specific style that I could map clearly onto this based on what I remember from The Skin of a Lion. In The Skin of a Lion was interesting because it was probably the first novel that I read that was aimed towards adults. So I read In The Skin of a Lion in 2014. I had a tutoring student who was doing this for their high school text. They weren't someone who liked reading very much. And at the time I didn't like reading a whole lot either. But I decided I would read this so that I would know what I was talking about and I fell in love with this book. It was just incredible. I, it was the first time I finished a book and I went, that is clearly a five out of five. This is amazing, I'm a fan. There's just so much beauty and vividness and wonder in this book that I just absolutely loved it. But my student didn't. My student didn't like it at all. And so <laughs> it set me on this horrible, horrible path of being someone who likes books. Anyways, revisiting this, I was very curious to see whether I would like it as much as I remember liking in The Skin of a Lion. I was quite doubtful because in the first hundred or so pages I went, this is slow, this is distant, this isn't really hitting me. And then around the hundred page mark, just something happens, something very traumatic happens, and it just it just gets to you. It just it it blows everything out of the water. It's just an incredible moment where all of the emotion that's been withheld from you up until this point is released at once and just overwhelmed. It's incredible. It's and it's something which I think only can happen with the distance that is built in the first hundred or so pages. In the beginning, it's just introducing who all these people are and how they get to the house. And the narration is very sparse. It's very zoomed away from the characters. We understand their small details, but we never really know what they think or what's in their heads or their hearts or what makes them tick. And then all at once, this critical moment comes and just reveals these characters for who they are and it's just incredible and i could really map the same thing happening in in the skin of the lion i remember and actually the moment in this book i remember the most clearly is around the hundred page mark where that incredible emotional thing happens that blows the whole story out of the water the same thing happens here but the interesting thing is from that emotional moment now that we've come to care about these characters and invest in the characters then we go back to the real world and the story re resumes its interest in the larger scale societal and thematic concerns that it has, knowing that the reader is enamored with these characters. And it shows how no matter how powerful our feelings are for any one individual, we can't quite fight against these big societal forces. In this case, it's World War, I, World War II and the legacy of colonialism and the way that people are just so incredibly good and incredibly motivated at hurting each other and so there's a lot of tragic moments here but nothing quite ever reaches that first emotional hill at the 100 page mark from there you're revealed so much about world war ii and really the small niche of it is that this book is focused on the north african campaign which has a lot of desert environments it's so different to what we normally think about when we think about world war ii and yet these characters are so intimately connected with their, their nations and their pasts and the fighting that goes on, and yet it is also so distant and so human. I enjoyed this so, so much. This is another 5 out of 5 for this month. I really, really liked it. I am a fan of Michael Ndaje, which is weird to say because I feel like his work is very divisive. I can definitely see a valid argument that this book is boring, it's slow, it's convoluted for no real reason, I think it's risky. It takes that risk of being something the reader will be put off by and then manipulates that assumption to deliver an incredible emotional punch. And I think that punch landed for me both times that I read his novels, but I can also imagine that punch really missing if you don't care about the situation and the characters as much as I ended up doing. So yeah, for me, it is a five out of five and I, hope that I can explain what makes it so good and so meaningful without giving out all the plot details. I actually think that if I was to just take that emotional moment, take it out of its context and show somebody, it wouldn't have that remarkable quality. I think you need to work your way through the detached opening and get used to the fragmented way of storytelling and learn a bit about the history and know what's about to happen. And then, then the emotions hit so, so hard.
So, yeah, it's a very specific one. I can't think of a lot of authors that work in this style, but I am very excited to, maybe not immediately after, in a few years' time, revisit this author, read something else. I know Anil's Ghost is also very famous, and I'd read that, but I would certainly recommend either this or The Skin of a Lion, especially if you care about historical fiction and not unusual, not not exotic, but just slightly more niche historical environments. If you like historical fiction but you're tired of like World War I and, World War, and the obvious side of World War II, then these books are really strong recommendations. All right. Okay. So that is everything that I read in March. And there's a lot of great books in here. Probably the first two 5 by 5s that I get in this year. So very, very exciting. Lots of great stuff. I hope that you find something that you would like to read or you'd like to revisit. I always want to do something new and something old, something famous and something niche every month. So hopefully this is a good mix. Let me know if anything sounds interesting or if you have a different take on any of these books. I know I give a lot of hot takes and I don't preface them very well. And yes, thank you for joining and I will see you guys next month. Goodbye.